Hi, Courtney. How are you doing? Hi, Gu. Hey, I'm hanging in there. How are you? Yep, much about the same, hanging in there. You look beautiful. I like your purple shirt. Yep, I'm loving that necklace. We did um, text this morning about our outfits, and I was thinking it would be really funny if you told me what you were wearing. I had already told you what I was wearing, and then you told me what yeah. you were wearing. And if I tried to change into what you were wearing, <laughs> so that when we got on, you show like, up and twinning. Yeah, exactly. No, we're not twinning. Um, we are co-hosting a new podcast, and we are so excited to introduce it to you all today. Um, a little bit about who we are personally and professionally. Um, my name is Courtney Martin, and I am a journalist by training. I co-founded something called the Solutions Journalism Network um, with longtime school uh, devotee David Bornstein, who many of you may know. Um, I've also worked on a lot of different philanthropic projects, uh, including um, was one of the founding members of the Audacious Prize at TED thought a lot about shaping that and how philanthropy worked through that experience. I've written a bunch of books. One of them was called Do It Anyway, The New Generation of Activists. Um, and I have a new one coming out this uh, August called Learning in Public, Lessons for a Racially Divided America for My Daughter's School. Um, my happy place is asking people questions. And I've wanted for so long to learn about uh, podcast creation and audio and so this is just kind of a dream come true, um, especially getting to do it with someone like Guhe, who is a true companion for real dialogue. And we've really gotten to know each other through this uh, process. So Guhe, you wanna introduce yourself? I do. Courtney, thank you so much for such a lovely um, sentiment. And that's exactly how I feel about you, just listening to you introduce yourself. I'm just like, oh gosh, Courtney is so impressive. And I was a fan of yours even before I met you. And um, we talk a little bit about that on the first episode. But yeah, it's just been such a joy and a pleasure. So hi, everyone. My name is Guhei. Um, I wanted to be obnoxious and start off by saying, you know, I'm trying to divest from capitalism and the notion that what I do for money has anything to do with who I am, but I'm not going to do that. So um, I spend most of my time actually <laughs> thinking about how um, how more philanthropic dollars can go to African social entrepreneurs. And uh, at one point I did work for the Skoll Foundation, which was such a great experience and and also brought me to to this opportunity, which has just been Amazing. And I live in Nairobi. And I think that you cannot be a person who comes from this part of the world, especially Nairobi, where we have the UN headquartered and, you know, not think about the kind of solving space. Um, I often joke with my friends that you cannot throw a stone without hitting someone, you know, an Ivy Leaguer who's come to disrupt some value chain or you know, bring us the new Uber of whatever. <laughs> and so I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about you know, who's a solver and who is a problem to be solved. And so, yeah, this has been such a great uh, process and just getting to know you, Courtney, and and also listening to these different stories and how people have come to to where they've come to. Yeah, um, I love that. The, you can't throw a stone without hitting an Ivy League. <laughs> <laughs> an Uber of global development. Um, you know, so, yep. so Yeah, so about this podcast, which you're probably already getting a sense of, um, what we really wanted to do was create a radically honest and fresh conversation about how change actually gets made and who makes it, to Guhe's point about who are the solvers and who is the problem um, getting solved. And we had the absolute honor and pleasure of having conversations with social, interview, social innovators who are tackling the world's biggest problems to build a better future. Um, and when we say big, we mean big. Um, this podcast is full of the most wicked problems you can think of. Um, access to healthcare, economic access, climate change, democracy, racial justice. Um, and I don't know, Guhe, if, if you, I think you feel similarly, it's not a feel good podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely wouldn't say that. I think these, the thing that has stuck with me the most is a lot of times after we're done recording, I just don't have any answers. These just like no neat bows. There's no package that this comes in where you can just be like, okay, yeah, we, we get it. You know, there's someone out there who's solving this ginormous problem, whatever it might be. And so, yeah, it's, it's not easy because a lot of times we do have to just kind of lean into these really uncomfortable 
conversations knowing that on the other end of it isn't, you know, a, a conclusion that's going to make everyone, you know, leave and have warm fuzzies that, oh, these are, they are great people, but these are great people doing great things, but it's not enough because these problems yeah. are just that big. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's not a feel good podcast, but I do think it's a make you smarter podcast. And mm -hmm. I also think it's a make you more honest podcast. Like there, Ooh, there's yeah. a lot of kind of moving in and out of systemic analysis and like personal reflection in a way that I think has pushed me for sure to think deeply about my role. Um, and I have a feeling it'll do that for our listeners. So, so you, you shouldn't come to our podcast to feel, feel like, um, I mean, you can come to feel hopeful, but it's, it's a measured hope. It's a very sober hope. Would you say, Guhei? I would. Yeah. I think that these, I think you can only be measured about these things. I think that anyone who's selling you, a dream or idea that will solve an entire, you know, climate change is is lying to themselves and they're lying to the listeners. And that's what I really enjoyed hearing is just the the real honesty about these solvers, about where they come from, um, when they approach these problems, but also, you know, how how vast it is and how difficult and and systemic so many of the challenges that they're trying to solve for are. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, we, we created, I think, by virtue of who both of us are and our own frustration with the film traffic space, the social entrepreneurship space as sort of no bullshit zone. So it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of honoring. There was an honoring of our guests, honoring of each other, um, honoring of the process that we're a part of, but not, um, not hero worship, as we've talked about, um, no magic bullets. You know, we've, we've really resisted a lot. And even in language, we've resisted a lot of the vocabulary of that, the world that we've both worked in at different points, um, I think quite deliberately so that we can have a fresher conversation. Um, but maybe we should just start letting people listen to some clips. What do you think? Yes, I'm so excited. Because in, in writing, we always say, show, don't tell. And here we are telling people what it is, but let's show <laughs> them what it is. Um, I think one of the things we did a lot of was leaning into discomfort as, um, as we know that that's the only way that real change and real consciousness happens. So I thought maybe we would play a clip um, from one of our most brilliant and most uh, discomfort producing guests in many ways. Um, could you play Esther Arma for us, please? The challenge that you have is that you're operating in a pure emotional patriarchy. You created an entire department that privileges, centers, and caters to the feelings of the white man who happens to be in charge. So he is willing to tweak, so everybody tweaks. He's not willing to transform, so nobody transforms. But you're centering that person. Wow. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. I remember the first time I heard that, I had to sit down and be like, are we allowed to say that? She said emotional patriarchy. <laughs> my goodness and it just like i had this image of you know like sunflowers kind of like turning towards the sun but like you know in the way that white men often are set up as like demigods and you know the sun moves and demigod moves and then you move but gosh we cannot move at the pace that you know the most comfortable of us are comfortable with because it's it these is too much at stake oh gosh that esther arma conversation just it, it stayed with me till today. It stayed with me. How do you feel about it, Courtney? Yeah, similarly, um, you know, I have a new friendship with Esther. And so we're having these like ongoing dialogues, which is what I think her work requires. It's not, mm. you know, her work is not something you can consume in a, you know, 15 minute morning news read and then be like, oh, there's this new concept and I've got it. It's emotional patriarchy and this is what it means. And here's how mm -hmm. I'm going to apply it to my life. And like, um, I'm going to tell everybody about it. I've tried to talk about her work and obviously we talked about her work together and it's mm -hmm. challenging because it is so deep and it is, uh, I think speaking of fresh language, she is really bringing new language that, that I wasn't familiar with. And I have a long background mm -hmm. in like women, ge women and gender studies and some of the things that she, you know, critical race theory, it's like, she's inventing her own lexicon in many ways and her own yeah. methodology that, um, which is why this episode is a can't miss. I just feel like she has so much to offer. Um, and, you know, as we talked about, it's just 
we're her her work and the conversation we had around it, including the conversation you and I had around it. And by the way, each episode is structured such that Guhei and I chat a little in the beginning. One of us does the interview, and then we chat at the end and kind of process how we both thought about it, which is so cool because we have such different life experiences and educational experiences mm -hmm. and perspectives. Um, I think that that her work is such a demonstration of the systemic change is never going to happen with, as you put it, you know, the Ivy League folks with the Uber of global <laughs> development. If if not because those people are inherently bad. But because no, if, you don't, if you don't do the internal work, then you won't do the systemic work at the level of complexity that it needs to be done, right? Yeah, and that's the discomfort with it, right? Like, how do you fund people to go on an internal journey? You cannot. And right. it's it's not particularly inviting to, you know, step into a space of discomfort when, you know, for much of your, probably your personal and professional career, you've only been in comfort. And so I think Esther is just doing something so courageous as well, because she's saying, you know what, like, we don't have the tools to actually solve for racial justice. We don't even have language for it. So here you go. I will take the time and, you know, spend the, the emotional labor to actually help people understand what this is. And, you know, this is this is the process. And it's not easy. It's messy. It's hard. Um, so yeah, Esther, amazing. Yeah. I love her. Also, I remember this one integrated the arts in a way that was very cool because mm -hmm. Esther's process of helping people with that internal transformation involves the arts in, in a way that I just found so powerful. And I know there are a lot of school forum folks who use the arts as a way to push culture. And, and I just think she's such an interesting example of that. So just to throw out that tip for those who do that kind of thing. Um, yeah, definitely a see. must not miss episode. Yeah, I think so. The other thing that we talk about are like really just big problems, um, urgent problems as well. Um, one of the clips that I'd love to share is um, we talked to Alessandro Orofino, who is working on, you know, how do you preserve democracy in Brazil? And, you know, I went into that conversation not entirely convinced that democracy was something to be saved, but I came out of it really, really challenged. And I know that I've had a lot of, you know, personal conversations about my own country and what um, democracy means for us because of this. So James, if you wouldn't mind running that Alessandra clip. I just don't take democracy for granted. <laughs> I never did, right? Because I grew up hearing the stories of how people have fought really hard to achieve this, to get to where we were to write our constitution, which again was written in 88. It was enacted in, in 89. And that was the product of people working for decades on building democracy. And it doesn't feel like that work can ever be called finished. Like it just, it's never done, right? And if we lose heart or if we lose sight of democracy, then it can be gone in a minute. So good. I think this this conversation that you had with Alessandra was just like the most timely thing as an American, because I think for, for a lot of Americans, the last, you know, you could say a year or you could say four years or five years, like has been this, and especially white Americans, this huge wake up call of how fragile democracy actually is. I think um, her, from a Brazilian perspective, um, and then you added your perspective. So there are all these great layers of just how how fragile all democracies are. Um, mm. And to your point, I love that you even come from the standpoint of like, and who knows if that's even the best, you know, framework for us to be proceeding <laughs> with. Like, if, it, if it's this fragile, is it is it really worthwhile? Um, so that that felt like one of those real south to north learning moments for me, listening to mm -hmm. you guys and being like wow, Americans have so much to learn from those who've been very overtly dealing with fragile democracies for so long. Yeah, and you know, you realize that it doesn't take decades to erode a democracy. You can do it quite yeah. quickly in, in just four years and land in a completely different place than, than you landed. And I hope that what it does is is create a little bit of, of compassion behind the headlines that that helps people just be like, we, we've been here. We, did, we never thought we would be, 
but we've been here. It's not an inherent flaw of the people who are over there that they cannot hold on to this tenuous democracy. It's that the system is really, really fragile and it requires so much propping up and people like Alessandra are working so hard to create that scaffolding that keeps that system in place, that keeps it running, that keeps it fair, that keeps it inclusive. And so, yeah, I, I left with like a lot of questions um, still still questioning whether it is democracy or not. But if it is democracy, then what are the things that like each and every person has to get involved in and behind in order to preserve that? Um, if this is the way that we're going to do it, then then let's do it in the way that's the most inclusive, I, I would hope. Yeah. Well, and I also loved Alessandra and you had this great conversation about the ways in which like democracy will disappoint you. Like it's inevitably... Mm -hmm. Any, any like representative democracy is going to be disappointing, right? Um, for so many reasons. But when democracy disappoints you, like how do you keep pushing democracy to be better? And yeah. how do you just make the thing that you need? Because she, she's yeah. such an interesting example of being like, we think the government should do this, but because it's, it's failing us, we're going to do it ourselves and hope that mm -hmm. we're going to do it so well that the government will adapt it. Which you see, you know, there's so many great examples of social change that that play out that way but i i really loved the way you guys talked about it in that sense um yeah and it was yeah. it also spoke to that that thing about our podcast that i felt throughout which was this dynamic between urgency to mm -hmm. your point the fertility of democracies and how they can fall apart so quickly and kind of telescopic time or like generational mm -hmm. change right like we i felt like yeah. we really tried to toggle back and forth a lot between those two. Yeah. Did that surprise you or do you, do you expect that to happen? Um, I, you know, I think when we started off, I definitely didn't think that that would be what it is because so often the, the solver space is kind of, has been so focused on individuals and individual organizations so that when you start to talk about generational work, you know, what does that mean? Because who knows about who's gonna come after and, and what you're building for them to hopefully pick up. But also, like, are, are we taking enough of the lessons from the past and, and carrying those forward? Um, so, yeah, there was something about that. And also uh, just, you know, community and how important um, each of these solvers, uh, to some extent, have uh, spoken about, like, how important their own communities are to them. Um, and, and even thinking about the types of problems that they, they want to solve and, and why as well. Yeah. Yeah, there was that generational perspective rooted in contemporary community and like the community of your ancestors or the community of mm -hmm. your um, your children's children, you know, almost like mm -hmm. this extended idea of, of who's in our community. Um, there's this beautiful concept um, called the 200 year present that this Quaker, mm -hmm. uh, this Quaker peace activist uh, I know has. And it's like basically the death date of the the potential death date of the youngest person you know and the birth date of the oldest person you know and you think mm -hmm. of like what can change within for me this is my application of is like what what can change within that 200 year period um yeah. and it's it's so powerful and it also gets to some of the pain like mm. that you know slavery here in the US context it's like the founding of this country 200 years ago there was you know, so many profound wounds that are within our present, if we think about 200 years. Um, mm. So anyway, I hope I hope that our conversations help people both think tactically and think in a very contemporary way, but also feel the depth of, of both the pain and the hope that comes from like thinking in a much wider time scale, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know who, who spoke so well to that? was Rodney. Should we listen to Rodney? Yes, we should. So so one of the more uh, frustrating things that happens when I'm in these rooms with philanthropists, and I'll give you this, this is a aged example because it happened five years ago, but I just remember being in the offices of a CEO of a major institution, extremely wealthy individual who pointed out to me that they said to me, Rodney, if you just spoke less about race and racism, I could help you more. You've just spoken less about race and racism. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to like slam on. 
So Courtney, here's the thing I think that gets to kind of the heart of what made the solve is that we talked to a little bit different is that as Rodney's talking about, you know, like speak about race and racism a little bit less, he recognizes all the ways in which those systems are so much a part of who he is, but also what he's trying to solve for. And so these solvers aren't outside of a broken system. They're like right in the mix and understand, you know, the impact of the tweaks that they're trying to make or the nose that they're hearing and, and what that means for so many other people. What did you think about that conversation with Rodney, which I loved? Well, you know, like I love him so much. Um, I, just, <laughs> I think he's so brilliant. Um, I that clip in particular, of course, made me absolutely furious, but it was I, I'm glad it, we got it on. You know, we recorded it because he and I have had a lot of um, awesome breakfasts together. He used to live in Oakland. He actually just relocated back to Baltimore. But um, and in our breakfast, those are the conversations we have are like real deal conversations about like mm. moralizing experiences he has um, of trying to make change within a system with so many unchanged humans so many like evolving consciousness yep. and um and so I'm, i i really appreciate that the conversation was that real that he was like willing on you know at well when the cameras are rolling so to speak or whatever i'd like to be honest about some of the the shit he's experienced um but also he's just undaunted i mean you know the other yeah. part of that episode is like you get this sense that he he and i really you know i'm a mother um as you know and motherhood comes up, parenting comes up in this podcast at different interesting moments. And I feel like Rodney's one mm -hmm. example of someone who's like, he, someone mothered him so well. So well. Oh, like, my and, goodness. and help yeah. him sit in a room like that and have an experience like that and walk out, not, not unscathed. I'm sure it affects his, his soul and it affects his, you know, mm -hmm. mood, of course. But like something about, and he talks about his mother in the podcast. Um, I think there's something about the way he was prepared for a still racist world mm. that allows him to both be in those kinds of rooms and still do the work, which he does describe very definitively as generational, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Courtney, we don't have too much time left. And I do want us to listen to one last clip, um, which is a conversation I had with Dr. Christian Hoppy, who's working Yay. on COVID in Nigeria. So um, can we please hear that clip? Pro Africans don't control the narrative about African story. And that's one thing that we are trying to do here. That is basically narrating the African the African story through the perspective of Africa by Africans that we understand the, the reality of Africa on the ground. Because, mm -hmm. you know, right now we are proving to the world that we can handle the infectious disease better. We handle this coronavirus better than the rest of the world. And this only could come true because we know this virus is better than any other person. We have managed more, more viruses than every other continent in the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, outbreak and pandemic response is not always a matter of money. It's also mm -hmm. a matter of experience. It's also a matter of, you know, understanding what these viruses are all about. Oh, I, that interview was so powerful. Um, it was so beautiful to hear the two of you in conversation about it. And it, it was, again, quite unexpected for me where... Dr. Hoppy has so much technical expertise to offer, mm -hmm. so much like yep. scientific chops. You know, he's just like yep. so intimidating in terms of his background and his capacity to do incredible scientific life saving work. But the conversation you guys had was also about God and about mm -hmm. like culture and black genius. And it was just like, mm -hmm. it went in all of these directions I didn't expect it to, which was so cool. Yeah, me neither. I was expecting to get into the technicalities of how do you map a genome? And I was like, I am going to be a fish out of water. But we ended up talking about something that's really close to my heart. And, you know, that you'll see that is kind of common across solvers, which is you understand that these are things that you're trying to solve for on the surface, but there's actually like the systems underneath that. And that, you know, the problem didn't come up yesterday and it won't be solved tomorrow, but you really do need to understand the system. So you really get to the the crux of what you're trying to solve for and that's what i loved talking about doctor um talking about with dr hobby yeah the system and the culture right very specifically mm -hmm. you guys talked a lot about the cultural the culture of colonialism 
-hmm. the legacy of it. Legacies, um, and we, yeah. yeah, I feel like that systems and culture layers were in so many of, of our interviews, which I'm so excited about because I think it can be overwhelming to deal with one of those, much less both of them, but we sort of <laughs> we dove into the overwhelm um, and tried to hold it for people in a way that, that was joyful and you know, really relational in terms of exploring it through the, the work of each of these people. Yeah, and I'm I'm hoping we we did that, and and people will want will will leave with a sense of yes, these are big problems, but you know these people to kind of come into community with as well, which I think is a big part of you know the School World Forum and the space is how do people come together to actually look um, unabashedly at like these really big problems, but then think about like, how does my solution complement your solution? How do you understand the system different from the way I understand the system? And then how do we come together? How do we make that magic happen? I love that. That's so beautiful. Um, like I said, we did not want to do hero worship. Uh, mm -hmm. But then the irony, of course, is that we kind of fall in love with everybody. <laughs> so we're Isn't like, that the, the biggest? <laughs> We're not worshiping you, but we're kind of in love with you. Um, it, it's tricky. I mean, they're just, each one of these people is just so profoundly committed. Um, we kind of started to think about what does make a solver, and we were like, they're obsessive, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're optimistic. optimistic. Yeah, mm -hmm. optimistic. Um, what else? Creative, very creative. Yeah. But I mean, really, and the accountability point you made earlier about being accountable to community, that felt like a big piece mm -hmm. that each one of these people is bringing a ton of people with them. And you can feel it when they talk about things, that they don't see themselves as individuals on an individual mission. Not at all. And I don't think you can be. Um, so should we tell people where they can find us? Yes. Um, so get out your phones, everyone. And I listen to podcasts on Overcast. I don't know what you guys like to listen to, but wherever you listen to your podcast, go to that and write in solvers right now. And it should pop up with our beautiful, like multicolored squirrel logo um, and subscribe. Uh, we cannot wait to, to hear what you think of it. You can also uh, tweet at, um, with the hashtag solverspod. And you can email us if you have a great story that you think should be a part of Solvers in the future, solvers at skull.org. On Twitter, I'm at Court Rights. Guhei is too cool to be on Twitter. So no, you it can. just gives me a lot of anxiety. And also, <laughs> Courtney, you're, you've got a blue tick. It's just, it's just very asymmetrical up here. <laughs> Girl, I will do whatever it takes to get you a blue tick if you act for that one. You, you deserve all the I'm blue good. ticks. You deserve a gold tick. We're gonna reinvent the tick. So, the tick is so, gold so tick. Kind. But yeah, if you want to tweet, if you want to tweet us, um, tweet us. Uh, I will send Guhe a telegram with your tweet in it, so she can read what it is that you wanted to tell her. <laughs> or a homing pigeon. It'll find me. Yeah, across exactly. an ocean. Yeah, a homing pigeon, along with the honey nut Cheerios that she yeah, can find. Yeah, and some Cadbury right cream on. eggs. And some Cadbury cream eggs. Uh, we've gotten deep in our, in our, uh, <laughs> when we stop record, things get very deep around here. So anyway, thank you for listening. We can't wait to get your thank feedback. Thank you for listening to us. Um, yeah. Looking thanks, forward to having you guys on this journey. Thanks, Bye, Courtney. Thank you.